All right, we're now in chapter 8, and we're going to start looking at the trumpets. Um, so, I think the first question that is worth asking in all this is just what sets in motion uh, the trumpets, the seven trumpets. Well, the first and obvious answer would be the opening of the seventh seal in Revelations 8.1, which we read last time, uh, that when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. Then I saw seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. So we got the opening of the seal, uh, starting the formal event of the seven trumpets, but there's something else that's also very important, and that is the prayers of the saints have a role in this. Because we read in the same chapter, verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Now, now meaning after the prayers of the saints have been offered to God, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. So, uh, interesting and exciting, uh, to say the least, um, the prayers of the saints uh, were, are, were part of the ceremony that puts the seven trumpets into motion. So, before we even get into the seven trumpets, let's kind of back off and take a high-level look and, and just make some observations. Because what we're going to see is that none of the seven trumpets result in anything that could be described as a natural phenomena taking place. And you're going to see some Bible commentators trying to do that, saying like, well, yeah, this is a, 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 a comet that's going through, or a meteor showers, or, or this is a, the result of a volcano. No, no. These judgments by God can only be seen as that divine judgments, things that are happening that defy the law of physics, that defy the normal forces of nature, that's being poured out, not only on earth and mankind, but also on the heavenlies. Because as we'll see, there's judgment um, in both on earth and in the heavenlies. Uh, so therefore, for us, reading the seven trumpets is best read at face value. For, uh, for what's being described by John, keep in mind also, he is seeing some amazing, unbelievable things, things that is just almost indescribable. And he, he does a masterful job, but also keep in mind, he is recording things seen from a 100 AD perspective, a first century um, perspective and a first century language. So, uh, for example, uh, he's absolutely clueless of something that might be called a, an airplane, if he saw that. Uh, how would he describe it? Uh, it? It might be a bird in the air, a great eagle or something. Who knows? Uh, but, but anyway, um, that's not drawing any conclusions or speculations, but at the same time, we got to keep in mind uh, the challenge uh, that John had uh, but he did, like I said, he did a masterful job there. Additionally, uh, uh, the key takeaways or the or the the lesson to be learned here is not how the judgments uh, are achieved. Uh, trying to explain uh, a force uh, that that happens, but why are they being administered? That's the important key message here. Why? 
is this being administered and what purpose does it serve uh, not only to mankind uh, at that time but also uh, the the key message that is a takeaway for us today to prepare for the future that's how we need to read uh, Revelation and the seven trumpets so having said that what do they accomplish well for starters they can be seen as restrained judgments being sent by God you might go wow this is restrained yes they're restrained even though we will see they will greatly escalate um, uh, from the very beginning uh, everything that's coming from the throne room is in escalation it's uh, and what we see now you know is, is in response to the saints prayers um, but this also should be taken as a serious final warning from God of his coming wrath but uh, these final warnings uh, are not necessarily intended to punish as much they are, as they are giving an opportunity that wow this is coming from God God is angry we need to repent we need to accept and worship God this is God's mercy in action however it is also setting the stage for the coming escalation of God's wrath being poured out in seven bowls. Now, another thing that they accomplish. Well, you know, down on earth, we got the, the Antichrist that's been advancing uh, in the Middle East, uh, that is attacking Egypt, um, attacking uh, countries around Israel, attacking going now into Israel, um, and um, setting up an occupation in, in Jerusalem. Well, all this is going to cripple his advancement and kind of keep him at bay. Um, and we read about, uh, uh, you can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 38, which we have already gone through. Um, something else though that's very, very important in all this is that these judgments are recorded before they happen and be in revelation and because of that saints that already know the book of revelations prophecies and know what to expect and shall we say have already mentally prepared themselves and process what could possibly happen in their lifetime um, they can be a voice of reason and a powerful powerful witness for god's kingdom in all this so um, this could set the stage for the church's finest hour in spreading the gospel news that which is god's coming kingdom and if you want to be a citizen of god's coming kingdom you have to look to the king you have to look to the messiah you have to accept what the messiah has done to atone for our sins and with that comes keys to the kingdom remember what we talked about in revelation uh the masculine the uh the wise man that and the role that they play and just to refresh our memories daniel eleven thirty one, it reads that forces from him that being the antichrist shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate which jesus talked about and what starts the great tribulation and also starts um, jacob's trouble uh, for um, god's jewish chosen jewish people but the people who know their god shall stand firm and take action so once again we have scripture showing us that people of god are going to be there during during this tribulation and the wise among the people what shall they do shall make many understand they're the ones that knows what's going on 
that understands, that will be a powerful, powerful witness. Though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. So, uh, the other thing that uh, probably should take note of um, is the trumpets. To be honest, they would be better translated as shofars or ram horns. Uh, this is not uh, uh, a day and age where people were standing up and uh, tooting their horns uh, that were made of brass, but instead uh, they were sounding off using ram's horns or shofars. So, having said all that, let's look very briefly at the seven trumpets. The first four trumpets or shofars. They're not tar targeted directly upon man, but instead they're targeted on the earth uh, and then one of them on the cosmos. So uh, they will harm the earth. They will harm the sea. They will harm the trees. And the fourth one is going to attack the, the ability of the sun, moon, and stars uh, to, to shed their light. So what are these targeting? These are targeting natural resources and, and, that, and also supply chains, such as shipping lanes in, in, in the sea of food and trade. However, the last three trumpets we will see, uh, first and foremost, they're going to be announced with a huge warning, a, di a divine warning coming from the sky uh, of three woes. And uh, they're going to target those who dwell on earth, who, very important here, do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So these are going to be selective judgments that have the capability to differentiate between God's elect and the unrepentant mankind the Antichrist, his armies, the followers of the world instead of the followers of God. And have we seen anything like this in the past? Yes, we have. Very, very important. And we have to also keep in mind that Scripture is placed where it is for a reason and a purpose. And there's a reason and a purpose why uh, we have what we call the Goshen Principle. Uh, during the days of, of uh, Egypt and Pharaoh holding uh, the uh, Hebrew nation as, uh, as slaves. In all of that, in all those judgments, what did we see? We saw that God protected his people as he was giving out plagues on Egypt. And here's three examples. Exodus 8, verse 22, but on that day, that day of judgment... Uh, that's being poured out on uh, Pharaoh and, and the Egyptians, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there. So, there's a reason and purpose here, so that you will know that I, Yahweh, the Lord, am in this land. Next, chapter 9, verse 26, the only place it did not hail, and if you recall, the hail was massive, uh, destroying uh, crops and livestock. Uh, the only place it did not hail was where? Oh, in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. Next chapter, we get into the, the darkness, in 10, verse 21, then Yahweh said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Total, complete darkness. Yet all the Israelites over in Goshen, what? They had light in the places where they lived. So it's a very, very important principle that, that we need to keep in the back of our minds. In fact, the whole book of Revelation, so much of it parallels what happened first where? In Egypt, with the plagues, um, with the deliverance of God's people, the crossing of the Red Sea, the Mount Sinai experience, uh, the, the wedding proposal that was given at Mount Sinai. We're seeing all of this as a foreshadow, a type and a foreshadow that parallels what we're now seeing in Revelation. So we always need to keep 
um, Exodus in mind when we're reading uh, Revelation. So, with all that as introduction, let's start looking at the trumpets. Revelation 8, verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass, all green grass was burned up. So right out of the first trumpet, we have a massive cataclysmic event that's going to devastate the plant-based food supplies of the world, as well as, as the food supplies that depend on uh, plants for, for food, so, such as livestock and, and birds uh, that, uh, uh, that produce milk and meat and cheese. Um, and once again, what does this closely resemble? This closely resembles what happened in the book of Exodus with hail and fire being sent by God. And we read in Exodus 9, 22. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven so that it may hail in all the land of Egypt, all man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff towards heaven and Yahweh sent thunder and hail and fire. Wow, we're just reading about this here in Revelation. Down to the earth. And Yahweh rained hail upon the land of Egypt. And there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. Very heavy hail, such as never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field, in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and the hail struck down every plant in the field and broke every tree in the field. So once again, we see this very distinct parallel of what happened in the days of, of Exodus in Egypt and what's now happening uh, with, the, with the trumpets being blown. Let's read on. The second angel blew his trumpet. And something like, now this is a good example of John trying to explain what he's seeing that does not make any sense from his perspective and in the Greek language. So he's going, oh, what is this? It's something like a great mountain. And it's burning with fire and it's thrown into the sea. And a, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So, good example of what's going on. Uh, and, once again, this is targeted against natural resources. That's going to greatly diminish the food supply of fish, which is a major supply of food in the world, and shipping of supplies by boats. Once again, what? This resembles what God sent to Egypt in the days of Exodus because we got the sea that became blood in Exodus 7:17. 7, what do we have? The Lord says, I will strike the water that is in the Nile and it shall turn into blood. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff, stretch it, hand over the waters, uh, over the rivers, the canals, and their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and stone. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the e Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. So once again, very, very devastating and very much in parallel what happened in Exodus. So now the third angel blew his trumpet, verse 10, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. So where the past was salt water and the sea, this is now fresh water judgment. 
The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, or bitter. And many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. So what does this judgment do? It destroys much of the world's freshwater supply. Extremely essential for the survival of mankind, for the survival of livestock and crops and fish and birds and wild animals. Stop and think about this. In desert arid regions where uh, uh, the water is prone to be bitter and alkaline, there's nothing there. It's devastation. So this is going to cause widespread panic. And water that's being poisoned, that's already captured um, in uh, Jewish thought and in the Bible as uh, something of divine judgment. Jeremiah 14. Why do we sit still? Gather together, let's go into the fortified cities and perish there. For the Lord Yahweh our God has doomed us to perish and has given us poisoned water to drink because we have sinned against Yahweh. And once again, this uh, very much speaks of what's happening here. Because man has sinned grievously against the Lord and is growing wicked and more wicked and more wicked. Um, as time marches on, God is issuing this judgment. So let's look at the fourth angel. He blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Now those of us that have sat in a uh, total eclipse, um, it's eerie. The darkness is very, very unsettling. And uh, once again, this is going to be a judgment that, that it's not just the moon, it's not just the sun, it's also the, the, the night sky and stars. This is divine. This can only come from God. And this is going to cause fear and confusion, uh, not only to man, but even to, to the wildlife. Every living creature is going to be unsettled. How long this judgment or any of the other judgments occurs, nobody really knows. But... Uh, another thing to keep in mind, if we fast forward into um, our world of the 21st century, uh, most likely, if that has not already happened in the sixth seal, which remember the sun, moon, and stars went dark, the sky rolls up, but it's very possible uh, that the satellites that we have in space will, will have or, or are being knocked out here. Um, such as GPS and communications, um, they'll all be gone. So, that's the first four trumpets. And now we're going to look at the last three trumpets. But before the trumpets are sounded, there is a powerful warning coming from heaven. Three woes. Verse 13 in chapter 8. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. At the blast of the other three trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So first and foremost, stop and think about it. For those that are... Um, Revelation savvy and the books of Revelation savvy, they know there's seven, we got three more. For those that are clueless what's going on, um, they don't know what to expect. And hearing this is just going to put them in panic. People will be in a meltdown mode. And if you think they're in meltdown mode now, wait till the three trumpets are blown. So, the warning is to those who dwell on earth. Now, is it everybody? No. It's to the unbelievers that dwell on earth. Why do we say that? It's because the Bible says that. And we will read, um, once this goes on, goes down, Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. Um, 
they were told what? Not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And we read earlier in the seven letters of the churches. And, and one thing to keep in mind is that so much of the seven letters in the churches were not only written to the church then and to the church today, but they also have some very key messages that are eschatological, that are, that are in time um, focus and in context. And here's just a good example, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, where Jesus Christ says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, and that's one thing that we have seen time and time again now in Revelation, that this calls for endurance of the saints and patience. What does he say? I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth, such as this here, to try those who dwell on the earth, which is what's happening to the unbelievers here. So let's go into the fifth trumpet. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. So John sees a star. That's what he's putting it in his words. But the star is a he. Uh, the star's an angel. And we'll see that uh, also in chapter 20, verse 1, which really spells this out, where, where it, John says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit, which is what we see here and a great chain. So what is this bottomless pit? Well, it's pretty universal uh, that uh, theologians say, well, it's not Hades or Sheol, which is the same thing, just Hebrew or Greek. It's more like a dungeon for certain demonic beings for things that they have done, crimes they have committed, and they are not allowed to roam the earth, such as uh, as some of the uh, demons or devils um, are able to do. Now, in the ESV or the NASB, they translate the word, and the word is abysos, uh, which means bottomless pit. So it's a translated word. However, the NIV and the Complete Jewish Bible they do not translate the word. Instead, they take a bisos and they transliterate it into a new word called the abyss. And so there is where we get the word abyss. However, we're just starting the fifth trumpet. So he, he being the angel that came down, opened the shaft of the bottomless pit. And from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke that's coming from the shaft. Then, from the smoke, came locusts on the earth. Now, locusts is the word John chose to describe them. And they were given power. Who ultimately gave this power? Well, it's by instructions of God, of course. Like the power of scorpions on the earth. And they were told, once again... You follow the chain of command up. It's all per God's instructions, not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So this is the Goshen principle. One thing also to keep in mind is that uh, in the spiritual world today and in the spiritual world, uh, world of all these judgments being released in the book of Revelation, God is in absolute, complete control. Remember that. God is sovereign. There is nothing going on that God does not allow it to go on. Keep in mind, God has told us from the very beginning, he's going to allow this to happen to his people. Why? to try them, to test them, to, to refine them uh, as, his, as his bride. And so 
um, we see this strange thing that's going on now in the, in the fifth trumpet. Well, has there been any forewarning in the, the Old Testament? Yes, there has. So let's go to the prophet Joel in Joel 2 verse 1 where he says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain because what he's seeing is just unbelievable, amazing. He says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord. And we know what that is. The day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful people. Like their like has never been before, nor will it be again uh, after them, through the years of all generations. So what he's seeing here is just so unique. Just like what John is saying, it's so unique. How do you describe this? And, and so Joel goes on and he says, Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like a garden of Eden before them, but behind them it's desolate. It's a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance, well, their, their appearance, it, it's like the appearance of horses, which we're going to read in just a couple more verses in chapter 9 here. And like war horses they run, as with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble. Well, that's kind of like locusts coming in and invading the land, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, peoples are in anguish. They're suffering, they're hurting, and we're going to read this in the fifth trumpet. All faces grow pale, like warriors. They charge, like soldiers. They scale the wall. They march, each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path, and they burst through the weapons, and they're not halted. They leap upon the city, and they run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. Has this ever occurred? No, never. But it's occurring now with the blowing of the fifth trumpet. So let's read on. Verse 5. They were allowed, they being this locust-like army, they were allowed, so they, they're, they, they think, they see, they process, they obey orders. They were allowed to torment them being unrepentant mankind for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die because of this pain and suffering, but death will flee from them. Wow. Wow. But we're not finished. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. Hmm, very similar to what we read in, from the prophet Joel. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold, and their faces were like human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth uh, like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates, like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings. It was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into the battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions and their power to hurt people for five months. Five months. It's in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name? Well, in Hebrew it's Abaddon and in Greek it's called Apollyon. So, this fifth trumpet is massive, it's cataclysmic, but it brings not death, only suffering. Once again, why not death, only suffering? This is another opportunity from God to repent. Why does John give such a detailed description of what he sees? Well, I think to leave no doubt, none whatsoever, there is nothing natural in this. This is divine. This is coming from the Almighty God. 
the names of Baden and Apollyon, uh, Hebrew or Greek, they both have the same meaning, the destroyer. So, the first woe has passed. We got two more woes still to come. And we will pick up on the second woe and the sixth trumpet in our next video.